Welcome to another BritFlix.com podcast. My name's Stuart Wright, and today's guests are the co-directors of Scala or the incredibly strange rise and fall of the world's wildest cinema and how it influenced the mixed-up generation of weirdos and misfits. Welcome, Jane Giles and Ali Catterall. We're going to do a bit of a discussion about the documentary, and then we're going to break off and talk about three films that have influenced everything in your adult life. Um, so let us start with the Scala, three exclamation marks, I should add. Following the book, where does the journey for the documentary begin? Good question. So when the book came out, published by Fab Press in 2018, September 2018, um, several different people actually asked whether or not there was going to be a documentary based on the book. Um, I th- because it's very cinematic in terms of, obviously, it's subject matter. It's, it's a book about cinema. But also... Um, there were stories in the book that weren't really kind of like that needed kind of like more space to come out. So I started looking into the idea of um, doing a documentary based on the book. And also I'd stumbled across some um, bits of archive footage that I didn't know existed, some amateur archive, a whole hour long chunk of it, which I didn't know about before. It sort of came out the woodwork after the book was published. Um, also a three minute long student film shot at the Scala in 1992. So I knew there was archive footage that hadn't been seen before, in addition to the fantastic Michael Clifford 30 minute film Scala that he made for um, Cable London back in 1990. And also sort of more importantly, I knew that I had some people around me who were interested in making a really good film about the Scala. Um, First and foremost was Channel X, who were the first producers on board. Um, they uh, mostly made television comedy. They made um, uh, the incredibly strange film show with James Ross back in the day, and that actually launched at the Scala. Uh, they made the uh, Vic and Bob um, Shooting Stars programmes, and also they made Detectorists, the fantastic um, uh, metal detector uh, um I don't know what you call it, comedy drama. It's it's a sort of folk drama. It's wonderful. Uh, so they came on board and um, along with Andy Stark, who is the producer of the films of Ben Wheatley, Peter Strickland, Prano Bailey Bond. Um, so we started kind of like exploring what a film about the Scala would look like. We actually tried to find a director for it and um, couldn't find anyone available at that time. That was like back in sort of 2019. And so the producer said to me, you do it. And I knew that I couldn't do it on my own. So I said, I'll do it if my editor of my book, Ali Cashel, who I'd met during the researching of the book, um, he's someone who has a really interesting story to tell about uh, being a student up the road. So um, the producer said, go for it. So that's how Ali and I ended up co-directing this documentary about Scala, which is sort of loosely based on the Scala book that we discussed back in 2016. So Ali, um, and this this, this is the question I'll I'll ask you, Jane, as well. But first you, Ali, what was your, what was the first time you crossed the threshold to go to the Scala? What was, what took, what took you there in the first place? Well, this, this is interesting because I didn't live anywhere near King's Cross. I lived down in in, in Chelsea, uh, near World's End. Right. Uh, we kind of what we call the wrong end of Chelsea. And um, the reason I was in King's Cross, which 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 no one with any sense would have gone if they didn't live in King's Cross um, already, because it was an incredibly insalubrious place, as, as, as you possibly know, it was I was studying at a um, very progressive liberal college of further education called Kingsway, Kingsway Princeton College, it was called then. Hmm. Uh, it was a place where the Sex Pistols had actually um, attended, I wouldn't say educated, but attended um, about 12 years before me. People like sort of John Lydon and uh, John Wardle, Jar Wobble and, and, and John Beverly Ritchie uh, and all the Johns. Hmm. They were all called John. <laughs> okay. And um, they all attended Kingsway. And uh, as I said, it was a very sort of liberal place. And it was for, it was for kind of school dropouts or kind of... Um, uh, sort of smart working class kids or otherwise distracted children, uh, people like me who'd come from a extremely bad background and, and, and incredibly, um, can I swear on this podcast? You can, yeah, yeah. Incredibly fucking fucked up background. <laughs> um, 
I'll, I'll, I'll give you um, I'll give you the top line um, later of that when we talk about performance. But for now, I found myself in Kingsway, and Kingsway was um, about five minutes walk from the Scala, and I was coming out of Kingsway one day in uh, I think October, so about a month after I started, and I saw there was a film called Birdie there by Alan Parker. Uh, it was with Nick Cage and Matthew Modine. And um, it was a story about obsession and mental illness. And, and a guy thought it was a bird. Actually, he was a Vietnam vet. He had a traumatic, terrible time and sort of got into his head. Um, and I thought, that's for me. That, that, that's absolutely up my street. And I, and I went in and I was um, incredibly daunted because um, at that age, you know, sort of 1986, um, you, know, you know, the only sort of places available to me were those kind of moth eaten sort of multiplexes, you know, your kind of local multiplex where, this, you know, the aromas of popcorn and candy are kind of pumped in and you, you're seeing, you know, your usual kind of mainstream fare. So the Scala was something very, very different. And, and that was what happened. And gradually I fell in love with it and it became a, it became a home from home. And do, do, you, do you remember a tipping point where it becomes a home from home? Because obviously they're stumbling across a place. And then there's making somewhere kind of like your cultural home, as it were. Yeah, it, 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 yeah, it, it took about a month or so. Um, during that time, probably as is probably common with people who enter the Scala, you start inviting your mates, almost for kind of protection. <laughs> <In a> way, <laughs> it's like, you know, this place is fucking mad. You have to, you have to experience this. And so, you, you know, you, you start taking friends and sooner or later you become a little gang and you start going and then you... And you start taking sort of dates and you start taking other sorts of people. And, um, and yeah, and, until finally it sort of gets, it gets under your skin and into your bones. And, and, and the Scala then becomes very much part of your DNA. And I think that's the experience for, for a great many people. Jane, for you then, what, was, what, what do you remember your first, what was your first memory of that, that moment that, that you were drawn to going up for the first time? My experience is slightly different from Ali's in that... Um, I lived outside of London near Gatwick Airport. I was 16 years old, so just 17 years old in the summer of um, 1981. And I was knocking around with a bunch of school friends, a bunch of punks who would go up to London and explore the King's Road, explore, uh, go to venues. Like I remember like we had a, a, a trip up to the Lyceum to see the cramps. Um, so we go to gigs and uh, they discovered the Scarlet in Fitzrovia um, just off the Tottenham Court Road. And uh, it just moved in 1981. Um, Channel 4 uh, came and um, sort of evicted the Scala from its premises in Fitzrovia in April 1981. Okay. So um, the cinema owner, Steve Woolley, and his staff uh, managed to negotiate a bit of cash um, from the deal of uh, Channel 4 coming in to um, find alternative premises, which was actually barely a mile up the Euston Road to King's Cross. So they moved in in three months flat. It was an extraordinary feat. And um, so I was there in August 80, uh, 1981 um, after the Scala had opened in King's Cross in July 1981. I was there for an all-nighter. Um, I came up with my mates from Crawley. They already knew, like I said, the Fitzrovia Scala. They were a bit scornful of this massive, dirty old picture palace in King's Cross. I think they liked the other one because it was sort of like fairly newly built. It had been built in 1976 mm. as the other cinema. Um, and it was quite intimate and it was underground, whereas the Scala in King's Cross was overground and up. But I just fell in love with it at first sight. So my experience was different from Ali's in that I went with a group of friends from the outset. I went to an all-nighter and I fell in love at first sight uh, rather than... Um, and it was sitting there in that massive auditorium um, watching films like The Living Dead at Manchester Morgue, um, five films in a row, being with a group of people, being away from home, which was really important to me. Um I knew that I could stay up all night because I spent the summer cleaning airplanes um, at night as part of a crew in uh, Gatwick Airport just to earn some sort of holiday money. But I'd become part of that sort of nighttime economy and, um, and, and found it quite magical, actually. I mean, the sights of the lights, um, you know, kind of like across Gatwick at three o'clock in the morning were stunning and 
sun rising and rabbits running down the runways. It was it was really sort of special. So I like that feeling. And the auditorium at the Scala at night, um, even though there are people sort of sleeping <laughs> on the floor between the rows, between the films, but like sitting there pushed up against my boyfriend listening to um, Joy Division for the first time. I don't think I'd heard the band before. I remember sitting there hearing Love Will Tear Us Apart sort of booming around that massive auditorium when cinemas, like Ali alluded to, how other types of cinemas were at the time. So I was literally used to the the you know the embassy in Crawley that would show windmill uh, play windmills of your mind as intermission music. <laughs> I think it's sort of great now. I I would listen to windmills of your mind now, but at the time it just seemed really like old school and really sort of stifling. This was something really new. What comes across clearly in the documentary is as much as there was a fantastic program at the you know, from the day it started, so to speak, it was always a bit on the edge. It was always daring. Often experimental stuff was shown. Um, but but going to see films is ordinarily a kind of, almost like it's a it's a shared experience, but it's also a singular experience. So how out, because the shared experience is just sitting in quiet dark with loads of strangers. That's generally how a cinema works. But, but it, what's clear from the documentary is a social life emerged out of the Scala, which doesn't seem to sort of go with go with the idea of going to see films. So what how, why do you think that is the case? I mean you Ali, you talked about, you know, one of your your tipping points was you just started to bring your friends along and stuff, you know, this this weird and wonderful place. So what is it about sort of that kind of film culture that sort of sort of breeds itself as it were? I think you have to look at the fact that the Scala more than many other reps at the time was, had been, and continue to be in places, a music venue. And I think that's very important. I think it's significant to look at something that's more than a cinema, something that has the kind of community vibe, or at least kind of gang treehouse mentality um, of a gig. These, these were films as gigs. They were not films as kind of sacred uh, objects that you, 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 you kind of turned up to and venerated necessarily, although people certainly did. Um, but think of it as a kind of gang mentality. And this is reflective in the kind of tribes who went there and certainly tribes who were from, um, you know, from a kind of almost sort of social cultural kind of point of view, uh, music tribes, quite a lot of them. So you had the rockabillies, you had the punks, you had the post-punks, you had the goths, um, you know, you, you had all kinds of people. So all those tribes came together to give you that kind of gang mentality, which was more like going to a gig, if you like. So, so when you're sitting there in the Scarlet, in the dark, watching the films, it's almost like you're watching a band. It's almost like you're watching bands on film. And obviously, quite literally, you are when you're watching music documentaries. Um, but yeah, I, I, and, I, and I guess Jane would probably have more to say about that as well, too. Well, that, that's right. And I think what's really interesting is that it was the that immediate post-punk moment when it started, 1978. And... The thing about the, the thing about punk, obviously, it was it had that DIY, like anyone can be on stage. And I think the Scala had that feeling that actually the people in the audience were often the same as the people who were making the films that were on the screen. In the case of Derek Jarman, for example, he was someone who would literally come to the Scala to watch movies, but also to watch the audience for his own films, like. Jubilee and Sebastiani that were shown at the Scala. Um, so I think it's got that. And also because the Scala audience was quite raucous, like a punk gig or like any gig, actually, um, or nearly any gig, not, not everyone. But, you know, people would shout out people. There was this sort of sense of audience participation um, and um, that the really sort of like went along with the vibe of the venue and the nature of the films that were shown. And people at that time um, would certainly sort of like identify themselves culturally by the places that they went and the films that they watched and the T-shirts that they wore and the badges on their lapels. And I think the Scala was really a place that accommodated this kind of, well, it, you know, it goes back to what Ali was saying, it was a sort of tribal gatherings. But I think 
critically is the post-punk thing and also the political allegiances um, and the social allegiances that people made. So um, I remember back in 1980, uh, a friend um, having her passport photograph done and being turned down for a, a visa for America because she was wearing a CND badge. Um, so you'd wear your CND badges, you'd wear your anti-apartheid badges, you'd wear your punk badges on your lapel, um, and you would pick up your Scala program and you'd put it up on your wall and your friends would come round and they'd see that you were a member of this place. You'd have your little membership card in your wallet. So I think there are all these sort of like cultural signifiers that enable people to feel very much part of a scene when they went to the Scala. I think one of the ideological tentpegs of punk as well was that was that sort of breaking down of the, of the of the wall, the division between the audience and the people on the stage. And I think this was another kind of you know very much a kind of mo of the Scala and, and that kind of vibe. You know, that as Jane as Jane's alluded to, you know, sometimes the people in the audience would be be the people whose films you were watching, um, and that that definitely came out of punk. I mean, this was that th this was amongst all reps, probably with the exception of something like the screen on the green, which literally hosted the Sex Pistols and the Clash. This was the punk, London's punk cinema, you know, with that vibe and that legacy. To tell a story over 15 years is a long period of time. So pulling, to get, pulling, that, pulling that information together and everything you had at your fingertips and everything you'd known, plus new interviews you were able to gather, what, what do you remember being the biggest storytelling challenges for a documentary about Scala? Because... To me, you, you cram a lot into the into it. So in what sense, I mean, obviously, let's not talk about what's on the cutting room floor, but think about what what were the challenges for you guys as the filmmakers? And I guess if I start with you, Ali, as kind of bringing it, bringing it from a kind of audience point of view, what, what were you hopeful to get across in terms of in terms of the story for the for the Scala documentary? You know, I, I, I always say this, but first of all, as a kind of nascent debutant co-director, um, I've realized the most important thing when you make your documentary. Um, is to honour your subject. Um, hence, the film has a certain kind of aesthetic and a certain vibe and is using, uh, sort of mixing and matching particular kind of aesthetics from, from, from bygone retro films, the sort that would show at the Scala, hence sort of split screen and jump cuts and, and, and a slightly, slightly sort of grimy vibe. Um, more than that, as you rightly say, the Scala story is incredibly epic. It's sprawling. I mean, for me, it's no exaggeration when I say I think it's genuinely the subculture equivalent of something like the V&A, the Victorian Albert Museum. It's that big. You know, it's bigger than the Roundhouse or the Exploding Plastic Inevitable or whatever it is. You know, it's huge. Um, so to do this, you, you know, th there's a series of, kind of en entry points that we could have gone. Um, I remember very pretentiously in the early days, I mean, Jane may remember this about two or three years ago, uh, wanting to call it an all-nighter at the Scala. And this is when we thought we'd have more money, actually. Um, <laughs> we were going to frame it as a series of kind of... We were going to frame the film like a conceit, conceit of, of kind of five films, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll, with those kind of intertitle cards, and we'd have a different kind of thing. And, and for me, it was going to be quite woozy, the ambience. It was going to be quite ambient and woozy and quite sort of dreamy and dreamlike um, until we decided, no, let's just make a slightly straighter documentary than that. Um, some of these things are a consideration, as I say, the budget. Some of them are, as I said, because we wanted to get the vibe of the Scala. That was really important to us. Um, and what we've ended up with, I think, is very much like the Scala. It's this kind of kaleidoscopic, eclectic, incredibly Catholic, sprat book kind of approach um, that hopefully and, and, and truthfully and authentically sort of gets over the Scala experience. And what about for you, Jane? Because obviously you you were both the punter who went to see films and gig and bands there, but also you became the programmer there as well. So you had a, a very much an active role in what it did. So so what what for you were the storytelling challenges for you in this documentary? So we decided fairly early on in the in the filmmaking process that what we wanted to do was focus on the audience's voices, the audience who went on to become. Uh, filmmakers, writers, musicians, artists, actors and activists. That was our structure. Mm -hmm. um, we knew that we wanted a sort of approximate three act structure because that's a sat that, that makes for a sat satisfying piece of storytelling. We knew that we wanted to make a big screen documentary because the you know the subject matter and the form follow the, the form follows the subject matter. So um, 
And actually, the sort of sprinkling in of the management voices in the film, Stephen Woolley, myself, uh, Jane Pilling, Joanne Seller, Mark Ballon, Helen DeWitt were the cinema managers who were yeah. interviewed for the film. That actually quite came quite late into the process um, because we realised that in order to make something that worked historically in terms of its three-act structure as well as emotionally, um, we needed certain bits of information about the beginning, the middle, and the end. Mm. Um, so we needed the management to, to talk about that. It wasn't necessarily something that the audience could say, although we did ask each of our interviewees, and we had 50 of them. We wanted a lot of voices in this because the Scala audience was a million people over 15 years, and so we wanted to get a lot of um, different um types of voice into our film uh, both in terms of like gender and class and um, ethnicity and I think we managed to achieve that but we also managed to achieve like 50 hours worth of interview footage so one of the biggest challenges in the in making the film was in whittling that um, interview footage which was a lot of gold dust and as well as a lot of rubbish, um, down into um, one third of a 90 minute long film. So that's where the, the brilliance of our editor, Andy Sark, also our producer, hmm. um, assisted by um, uh, a guy called Ed Mills. Um, and we all worked together to kind of like shape the piece. And just to add that the, the three act structure is roughly. We thought about sex, drugs and rock and roll, but not in that order. We've got rock and roll, <laughs> sex and drugs, and there's a bit of kind of preamble and a bit of legacy. Um, but it's sort of roughly around that, or as Ali puts it, it's the sort of lead up to the party, the party and then the hangover and the sort of remorse at the end. Um, that's more or less our structure. What we knew we didn't want to do was a um, fairly straightforward sky art style documentary mm. historical documentary where the management the sort of you know the white management tells the people who weren't there what it was like what we wanted was our diverse audience expressing what it felt like to be there yeah no and that's definitely the feel that's definitely what you get as a viewer a sense of and and i, and I say that as someone that never got to go I, I grew up in manchester so the scala was very much advertised in the classifieds of the music press and things like that from from where I was viewing it from. So it was like, and I was seeing the kind of films you were, you were programming and thinking, I can't see that. That's a banned video or, you know, whatever it might have been. And so the Scala was always this sort of place on high ground from from where I was looking, but never I never got to see it. So to, to, to watch the documentary, it was so much fun to get the sense of, I actually, I got a sense of what I missed out and not in a kind of regretful way, but the experience, the way people shared their experiences of it made me feel like, you know, yeah, that was that was a gang that I mean, not, not a specified one, but it was a gang. We certainly made the film um, so that it would work for an audience who weren't there at the time. So um, obviously, if we only made it for the people that were there and are still alive, then that would be a very small um, group of people. And we found by taking the film out to festivals and um, internationally and cinemas around the country, um, that people really do have a point of connection with it. And it's interesting that some of the um, strongest voices coming out of the actual audience for watching our documentary are those of 20-something young women who come up to us and say, oh, my God, you know, I want to set up a film club. I want to work in archives. I want to work in cinemas. You know, they're super keen on it. But also people... Um, who and even though the Scala did have an audience from all over the UK and even internationally, and we saw this from the mailing list of the monthly program, um, but being close to King's Cross, the major terminus, really facilitated like ease of transport to London. Um, but we've also found that people are, to, you know, it rings a bell with them about like maybe you had a place in Manchester that had a feeling like that it might not have been it might have been a record shop it might have been a vintage clothes oh. shop it might be something else but it's certainly kind of touching touching the emotions of people just sort of thinking about what their version of the Scala was or could be I think James really touched on it I mean like in Liverpool you had Eric's in Manchester you had the Hacienda you know these, oh. these are music places but but as I said earlier you know the Scala the, the Scala as a cinema had more in common with kind of music venues almost in the cinema mm. 
Well, I mean, e- even even like the what was I mean, we've now got home in Manchester, but there was the corner house, and so I would have I was able to see things like a John Woo triple bill and things like that. So the flavour of what I thought of as Scala, I could get access to bits of it. But I think for me, looking at it, certainly in the eight through the eighties, Prism was. The Scala was like the I could have, I could have seen the Forbidden Fruit <laughs> as a boat, which is something that that you know I, it comes across really well, and uh, not in a kind of like weren't we daring way, but it just like it was like why not? You know, it was it was more of a why not show because it was in the end they're only films. They're not they're not as dangerous as 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 the as the government at the time liked to make out that they were. We've come to the end of our conversation about the documentary. Uh, I'll put links in, I'll put links and dates in the show notes so people can. Uh, and find out how to watch it in the new year. Um, but now we shall move on to three films that have impacted everything in your adult life. Just so you know, what we're going to do is we're going to do your three films. We'll have a five-minute timer going on um, so that when, when five minutes are up, you will hear this noise at five minutes. Okay. And that's our five minutes up, and then we move on to the next film. Okay. Okay. Right then, let's start off with your first choice, which is Un Chant de Mort by Jean Genet, 1950, a 25 minute sort of long short. So what 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 was the reason for choosing this film? Where does this fit in your in your film fandom and, and maybe in reference to the Scala? Well, as I said, I discovered the Scala in August 1981. Um, and then I carried on going to the Scala for throughout the 1980s. And I started at film school in Reading um, in 1983 and was doing a very interesting course and discovered the films of Rainer Werner Fassbinder. Um, and we were studying melodrama. And so um, like Fassbinder's melodramas, uh, uh, Fear Eats the Soul, um, compared to, you know, the, the films of Douglas Sirk. So it's quite an academic course, but really exciting and really opened up um, ideas about uh, wanting to seek out films by those filmmakers that we were only sort of learning about, not mm. necessarily seeing their complete works. So the Scala provided a sort of alternative, like parallel curriculum to what I was studying at film school in Reading. And I noticed that the Scala was showing Corel by Fassbender. And having really loved Fear Eats the Soul, I went to seek it out um, at the Scala from home, from where I was living in Reading. And there was a short film showing with it, and that was called In Chant de Mort. I didn't know that at the time because the film had no kind of like header on it, like the, the, the title was lost. It was silent and the projectionist was show, uh, playing, I think, Eric Sarty music or something like that hmm. um, over the top of this silent black and white, 25 minute long film, which was about two men in prison trying to communicate through the prison wall. And it was very romantic and very explicit. And I couldn't quite believe what I was seeing. I, it was sort of like, what is this? What is this little scrap of film? Um, and the looks at the programme, I saw it was by Jean Genet, um, who wrote the book of Corella of Brest that uh, the Fassbender film was based on. Ah. And I became really interested in Jean Genet, and I started like reading his books and being really excited by that literature in the way that you know, music and film and books and, you know, what your friends were reading and recommending all became part of the thing. You'd read William Burroughs because your friends recommended it Mm. or Jacques Correc, a very kind of like 80s um, publishing scene. Um, So I um, couldn't find any information in the library about and Chante Moore. It's obviously pre-internet. This was mid-80s, pre-internet. And then when I finished my film course, I asked my teacher um, what he thought I should do next. And he suggested that I should do an MA in film. Um, So I asked if I I didn't want to like everyone at that time was doing like MAs or PhDs in the films of Alfred Hitchcock or, you know, and it it was massive. And I didn't want to do that. So I said to him and his name is Richard Kutnowski. Actually, he was a fantastic. He was a great teacher still is a great teacher at the London Film School, um, but he would go on from that point to direct a lovely film called Love and Death in Long Island with Jason Preecy and um, John Hurt in it. Anyway, um, Richard said, well, when I said I could only really imagine writing about something really small, 
he said, why don't you write about Nishanta Moore? So I applied to film, um, applied to Kent University to do an MA to uh, by research and thesis. And my subject was Nishanta Moore by Sean Cheney. I thought it was a good idea to study and research something that there was very, very little information about. And right at this moment that I started work, Jean Genet died. And I read an obituary of him by an American author called Edmund White, who was famous for his semi-autobiographical novel, A Boy's Own Story. Mm. He was an American writer living in Paris. And I wrote to him and asked him where he got some of his information in the um, obituary from. And he, being Edmund, a very generous person, immediately invited me to go meet him in Paris and collaborate with him. Uh, he was writing this massive wow. auto, uh, this massive biography of Jean Genet. It's like 800 pages or something. And I was my, write my thesis about this little film. So we worked together. He took me to the south of France to meet Lucien Senemo, who was one of the men in the film. And I got incredibly privileged information for my thesis. Um, actually, I didn't understand film studies. I didn't understand psychoanalysis and semiotics, but I did understand history. And my thesis was published as a book by the BFI in 1991. Um, and it also that led to them obtaining the rights to Enchanté Moore, publishing it on VHS and DVD, and film prints of it being available to this day. Amazing. They new score from Simon Fisher Turner which is beautiful as well and um it was like a really it's an important film for me because it's not only beautiful and great and really sexy with these gorgeous men and their naked bodies in it it was just the sort of thing that a woman like me wanted to be watching um but also it was my first publishing gig your second film is A Clockwork Orange Kubrick's classic from 1971 do you want to tell us where that fits in in the Jane Giles canon Sure. So, um, and Sean de Moore is a really interesting example of a film where the rights kind of like came and went. Mm -hmm. And all films um, are subject to rights. And I grew up in an era where it was impossible to see Clockwork Orange um, in the UK because it had been withdrawn from distribution back in the early 70s. Um, I think everyone knows the story. I won't mm. go into it now. Yeah. It was due to kind of like, you know, threats of violence against the director, due to kind of, you know, sort of supposed copycat violence um, or sort of youth, like violent youth saying, Clockwork Orange made me do it type thing with yeah, their yeah, defence. Yeah. So it's really hard to see this film. Um, and you'd have to go to Paris, which wasn't any hardship. You know, you could fly or go on the boat to Paris. You could see the film in cinemas there. You go to Berlin, you could see it there. Um, but when I was managing the Scala in the late 80s, early 90s, we had a selection box in the foyer for people to put their suggestions of films that they would love to see in it. And every single day you'd get like slip after slip after slip of the paper that scribbled in biro clockwork orange please 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 clockwork orange clockwork orange people were really desperate to see this film not on pirate video i wasn't really a kind of like video watcher um i'd grown up with a uh, betamax in the house so we could rent those big videos like evil dead like pre bright bill pre video nasty yeah um but when I, by the time I was a student, like video machines were too expensive um, and computers didn't exist. So cinema was really the only way or television was the only way of seeing films. Um, so at the Scala, when I had the opportunity to show a collector's print on 35 mil of A Clockwork Orange on my big screen, and I had that, you know, sort of authority to um, show what I wanted... I made a very hasty decision to um, put the film on in a double bill with um, as a surprise film, a uh, double bill with Lindsay Anderson's film F. Mm -hmm. And um, it turned into a sort of nightmare. Um, the uh, screening was, it was an illegal screening. It was um, reported to the film's distributor, Warner Brothers, who reported it to the trade organisation, the Film Distributors Association, 
who reported it to the Federation Against Copyright Theft, which was an organisation set up, funded by the studios to fight illegal VHS replication. Yeah. Um, they pursued a criminal prosecution against me as the person, um, as the you know responsible uh, person of the organisation at the time who'd made the decision to programme the film. Yeah. The whole case dragged on for a year from 92 to 93 and was um, a really depressing drawn out expensive um procedure it's not the reason why the scala closed um scala closed because the lease ran out and the parent company palace pictures um did not exist by that point they'd gotten into financial problems um also king's cross was being redeveloped to make way for the channel tunnel uh, t- uh terminus that eventually came into st pancras so there was all and it was a time of recession, as well as kind of like the growth in, in VHS. So audience behaviour was changing. So that's a rather long-winded way of saying that the film impacted on me because um, I did make a decision to show it. I did take responsibility, but it's kind of followed me around for the last 30 years. Yeah. People say, you know, you closed the Scala by showing Clockwork Orange. I didn't close the Scala by showing a Clockwork Orange. It didn't help, but it wasn't the reason. What year, what was, year was that when you showed it at the Scala? 1992. I'd actually just left my job. I'd, I'd sort of moved on. I was working in film distribution by that point, um, but continued to be the person, you know, liable. Yeah, even yeah, though yeah. I was actually not actually working at the Scala by that point. Yeah, because I left in mid-92. Just to give the listener a sort of context, you, you not only sort of showing it, breaking the what, what the people... The, the, the copyright problems but the ban wasn't lifted till 99 on seeing the film full stop so yeah i mean i think this is one thing that was interesting um like at the time the kind of press coverage of the court case uh screen um screen international now screen.com screen daily published a really nice little piece finish your right, thought so. finish your thought saying i hope that when scott i hope that when uh, a clockwork orange is finally re-released by Warner Brothers after Kubrick's death, they'll give a full apology and financial reparation to Jane Giles. <laughs> and that's exactly what happens in terms of the reissue six months or a year or so after Kubrick died. And no, I never got an apology <laughs> or financial <laughs> reparation. But the film finally came out and now audiences can see it legally um, in all its glory. And then finally, Ridley Scott's 1982 sci-fi noir Blade Runner so Blade Runner when I talked about like that summer that I was cleaning airplanes mm. um, in the airport um, the lights at night and the feeling of the sun rising and the rabbits everything it had a real that was the, the, the summer that Blade Runner came out in the UK and it had a real vibe to it and um, I loved Blade Runner at first viewing um, and did program it at the Scala but then I'm talking about, I was talking with Clockwork Orange about becoming a distributor. Um, and that was the reason why I left the Scala. But Clockwork Orange became unavailable to cinemas to book. Mm. Um, oh, sorry, um, excuse me, Blade Runner became unavailable to cinemas to book um, when it was under license for the um, Blade Runner 2046, the, the, the prequel or the sequel, or yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, whatever it is. So, the rights have been withdrawn. The the Scott, um, the, the the Blade Runner partnership that owned the rights to Blade Runner withdrew the film from distribution. By that point, um, sort of um, mid mid um, sort of two thousand and eight, two thousand and ten, I was running distribution at the BFI. We were doing a big sci fi christmas season and the film that i really wanted to re-release as a classic modern classic was blade runner um which at the time was withdrawn from distribution it took me probably a year to negotiate the rights Mm -hmm. um with blade runner partnership with multiple lawyers involved it was a really really tricky negotiation um, which I finally achieved. I was, had an enormous sense of personal achievement in managing to legally license this great movie that wasn't available to cinema audiences at the time. 
Um, and the film went on to be like one of the BFI's most financially successful reissues of all time. So it was hugely profitable, just wonderful. And just to finish up that thought, um, I took my daughter, uh, I went with my husband and, uh, and our kids to see Blade Runner at NFT One as part of the South Bank season Um when it was reissued by the BFI. And uh, there were people in the audience like Spiz Energy, you know, it's like it was a full cinema. People had really turned out for it. It was a great vibe. Um, but we'd had to license the director's cut. That was one of the conditions, even though I wanted to license the version that originally came out on first release with the voiceover. I always really loved the voiceover. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was sitting there watching it in the NFT and my daughter turned to me at that point towards the end when um, Harrison Ford is dangling from the building and Rutger Hauer, who's dying, uses his last shred of energy to pull Harrison Ford up on top of the building. And my daughter turned to me and said, why did he do that? And I whispered in her ear, perhaps at that moment he loved life more than you know and kind of whispered the voiceover that was originally put <laughs> out the confusion of the audience at that point um and uh, it was a magical moment and i think that all three of those films that i've chosen as being films that have kind of followed me throughout my life and my career um i've chosen because they've been sort of magic but also They've been representative of moments in my career where I've been able to make something more widely available because that's really the role of the um, film distributor, which has been my primary um, job throughout the last 30 years. I, I think it's interesting when you pick up that point about the, the the sort of excitement within the audience, you know, that that which is the thing. I think that's the thing about what you would call event cinema, which is like obviously week to week we get new releases. So there's kind of like, if I miss this bus, I'll get the next bus that comes along. Whereas when you're programming a, a retrospective or a kind of classics thing, or even just things that don't fit in with the release program, there's a sense of an event. I mean, I was I was at the uh, variety screening that you did the Q&A at. Um, and at that event, I could sense that there was an excitement. You know, And I think there's something about that in cinemas. You, you kind of know when you're at one, don't you? you? There's a Everyone's coming in and people are seeing friend, you know, faces they recognise and that all adds to the buzz. We're so excited that um, the BFI South Bank are doing a whole season of Scala films, mm. um, great Scala greatest hits. And we're planning, and there's also some events, and we're planning some special intros, um, which are going to be thematically uh, themed intros, people being costumed, there'll be like audience participation, um, which I'm sure is a nightmare for some people. But, uh, <laughs> We really want to make a point about the liveliness of the audience. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, look, thank you for sharing those three films. Thank you, Stuart. Really always a pleasure speaking with you. And I'll hop off now. Thank you. Thanks for joining me. Take care. Have a good week. And I will abruptly now move on to, I'll let Ali into the room. Hi, how are you doing? First off is a performance directed by Donald Camel and Nicholas Rogue from 1970. Where does that fit in with with Ali Catterall? You, your note you gave me was where I come from. Yes. Um, so do we do we all know what performance is about? Shall I give Shall I give the um, uh, the, the top line of performance for those who are not aware of what performance is? Uh, so performance um, it stars uh, James Fox and Mick Jagger, and it's directed by Donald Camel and Nicholas Rogue, and it's um, it's about it's set. It's it's kind of where the craze meet Crowley, meet Alistair Crowley, uh, via uh, the Order of Assassins. Uh, very strange sixties reference points, but they all kind of come together in this glorious, uh, often pretentious, and completely fucked up melange. And it's about a gangster played by James Fox who's on the run, and he holds up in a um, fading rock star's house in Notting Hill, played by Mick Jagger, and. Um, in uh, James Fox's kind of gangsterism, Mick Jagger sees a way to, to, to kind of re-embrace his demon that he's lost, his kind of stage persona, his kind of demon. And he thinks he, mm. can, he can get this from James Fox, whereas James Fox just wants an escape at all costs. And unfortunately, he, 
he's, he bites off more than he can chew. So by the end of the film, um, both of them have kind of merged into each other's personality through um, through kind of. So what? So what makes this film important to you? This film is where I come from. Um, I grew up. Uh, I didn't grow up in Notting Hill. I grew up in Chelsea, which is kind of southwest of Notting Hill. But yeah. I grew up in a bohemian uh, squat in what I would say is Angela's Ashes poverty, or perhaps being hippie, it was lentil poverty, uh, below the breadline uh, with a Crowleyite stepfather, a practicing warlock uh, from a stepfather and a radical feminist from a mother uh, who later became general secretary of the Fawcett Society. Um, he was a psychopath. Uh, he was a regular practitioner of black magic under my startled nose. And all this is happening in this in this lentil poverty council squat. Uh, we were what you'd call kind of poor with books. There were hundreds of paperbacks, yellowing paperbacks around, surrounded by hippie paraphernalia. Um, or rather more kindly, we were arts and crafts. I think you might get the vibe here. Um, when I watch performance, there's certain scenes in that. Um, particularly where James Fox first encounters Power Square, where Mick Jagger lives, um, in which he sees kind of feral uh, sort of children <laughs> running amok um, through Power Square. That whole vibe was my childhood, basically. To watch performance now is to revisit um, an extraordinary time for me. Um, I'll also mention the fact that where I grew up might as well have been an enormous soundstage. I, I grew up in a road called Lots Road, uh, which is kind of uh, kind of then a kind of um, slum elbow of just off the King's Road in Chelsea, directly opposite the Lots Road Power Station. Um, and we were a kind of, being bohos, we were a kind of archipelago of otherness. You know, we were surrounded by um, fellow bohos. We, uh, we, we lived above an American performance poet who kind of held open house for kind of fellow artists and political distance and up-and-coming musicians, one of whom was called Philip Glass, who used to visit. Um, oh wow! Yeah, next door with a modern and classical composer and an underground filmmaker from from Oz, um, who'd who'd so who'd sort of project film noir classics and exploitation movies on his backyard late into the evening. It's one of my first memories of kind of sprawled on exotic cushions by hippies, kind of watching these films. It was almost virtually a primer for the Scala, um, and incredibly cinematic. And and for me, it kind of seemed natural that kind of film crews and commercial makers and video and music videos directors would kind of haunt our streets for years looking for sort of atmospheres. Uh, you can actually see my road in, a, in an old Ready Break advert. It was the hip hop one where everyone's sort of glowing like beacons. Um, and, <laughs> and sort of, you know, if, if you go and Google Ready Break uh, hip hop, you'll find it immediately. That's Lot's Road. And as someone comments in the comments, you know, that looks like the aftermath of a nuclear war, man. And, you know, it just looked like that. It li That was how horrible it was that's that's where i grew up um yeah i was gonna say yeah because for, for, for the oh there goes the there goes the five minute bell just i'll just say one more thing i just you know london's come a long way in 50 years hasn't it kind of thing in, it, it, in i terms mean the, of... the area I, I live around the corner now um we, hmm. we, we moved to a rotting house um with, with, with no roof I, mean, I remember once my bedroom ceiling uh, fell in when i was um 17 and um pigeons would kind of fly around the room sort of alfred hitchcock style and I was reduced to sort of sleeping on the floor on a dirty mattress surrounded by Tupperware containers, having a kind of tick-tock rain orchestra sort of around me. Um, so, th yeah, that, that was my life by the time I discovered the Scala. Um, so it's interesting to me that the kind of content of the movies I saw there uh, was just as surreal and disturbing, sort of outlandish as anything from my home life. But, but somehow the, the fiction of these films provided a kind of safety net, a kind of filter, a sort of this kind of crucial removed from reality, you know, which is why the Scala became a kind of refuge for me, as it did for so many other people. Um, so, so anyway, so, so, so to, to cut all this down, performance is where I come from. That's my life. So in, in terms of London being, being like a theatre set, being like a film set, then Theatre of Blood from 1973, your second choice, is, a, is, a, is almost like a technical, aversion, a technical or heightened version of London in the early 70s, isn't it? Theatre of Blood is... is, is also, I mean, it's, it's one of the great London films, funnily enough. But, you know, it, yeah, it is. No, without a doubt. In, in which you've got the cast and crew sort of roaming the depressed capital of the early 1970s. And in fact, um, the area I grew up in as well, again, I, I, I liken it to a kind of enormous soundstage because there is almost every slab of that bit of Chelsea um, has had a film crew pass it. I mean, point of fact, there's a scene in Theatre of Blood um, where 
a, a guy's drowned in a vat of wine and that the entrance to that to that little place is literally around the corner from Uncle Monty's place and with Nan and I, or you know, or where it was shot. Hmm. Uh, across the road is where Alex Delarge gets a kicking from 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 some old blokes underneath the Albert Bridge. Um, the houseboats just beside it are where um, uh, Oliver Reed uh, works in. I'll never forget what's his name. Um, and then, of course, around the corner there's uh, there's, there's Dracula's you know mini mini, mini skirted. Um, Acolytes from Dracula AD 972. I mean, it's it's no way. Yeah, almost every. I'll, I'll have to take you down there one day. Almost every slab of that of that square mile, the the blow up house, the party house, and blow up is there. Um, it you know, so so I grew up as I said on an enormous soundstage, um, which which which, which must have helped. I mean, it it kind of it impressed upon me the fact that kind of reality and fantasy were very close to one another, and they could be sort of punctured like skin, if you like. I mean, mm. um, added to this the fact that a friend of mine. Um, a, fr- a family friend called Paul Oliver, who's in everything. You'll see him in everything. Once you see him in one thing, you'll see him in everything. Is in Theatre of Blood. He's being prodded awake by Michael Horden at the beginning. You see Paul Oliver in Star Wars when C three PO and Luke walk into the walk into the um, cantina and he's sitting on the right, you know, at a table by himself. You'll see him in American Wealth in London, um, in in a sex cinema, sort of gazing with horror as David starts changing. Um, you'll see him in everything. So yeah, the- Theatre of Blood, my all time favorite film. Um, uh, I think sort of, yeah, yeah and, and personal for, for, for those reasons, not least of which the fact that I too am a member of the critic circle. So, so thoroughly expect to be done in by, by a maniac in a week anytime now, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, does, does it, out of interest, does, cause, cause obviously fr- framing something for a film means that what's not in the frame, we can't see, but obviously when you're looking at a place that you're familiar with. Are you able to sort of remove the reality when you're seeing the places, or do you do you, do you see the place that I, it really I, I is? I see the place. I mean, particularly where I grew up, Lots Road. I mean, like you, you watch the opening of Quadrophenia, the scene immediately after he's standing on the cliff edge. You've got uh, Phil Daniels and Co. and Phil Davis kind of racing down, racing down the road. That's Lots Road. That's my road. Um, hmm. The, the place where I'm living now is actually in a Terence Trent Derby video in Sign Your Name. You can literally see <laughs> my in that. But yeah, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, that was, yeah, and you can see the Lots Road Power Station in there as well. Also, very personal film, Theatre of Blood. I realise we haven't exactly said what it's about. It, it, it's about a critically... It doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So People also, can find that out. Also, Theatre of Blood, very personal for me as well, because it started me on the road to becoming a film critic, because it was the very first film review I ever wrote age 14 for english right in, in my in, really uh, yeah there you go that's that's the review theater of blood there you go um, and and aged 40 because it's quite i mean what what surprised me with theater of looks I, I i only saw it when they did the blu-ray reissue i'd never seen it before then and i was surprised at how vi- i mean it's funny but it's a violent movie but it's, it's it's i just love it it's i've, I've, I've written here age 14 the witticisms fly fast and furiously amid many stomach churning scenes. And I end, I end the review going, a superb cast supported by beautiful gags, although not recommended <laughs> for young children. I'm not 14 for fuck's sake, <laughs> do you know what I mean? But yeah, it's, um, I, I love it. I love it so much. Um, the, I mean, it's like yeah. an anthology. So for, for the benefit of the audience, what's your favourite What's your favorite sequence of the uh, of the revenge that's meted out? Oh God, it's got to be Robert Morley and his poodles, I think. I mean, they're, 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 <laughs> Robert Morley's poor poodles are baked in a pie. Um, after symboling. <laughs> it's basically Prince. It's basically Vincent Price's favourite of his own movies as well. For, um, that doesn't yeah, surprise yeah, he, me. He once said it was the best feeling of achievement and satisfaction I ever had from a film. Um, and Catherine Hepburn once said that that she thought that Price would have made a great Prospero from The Tempest. And I think really, you know, that here's the evidence. Really, here's the proof. And you know, the irony is for, for me, although Lionheart's supposed to be this terrible actor, you know, one of the critics calls a a ham sandwich. Um, his Shakespeare and soliloquies are actually really fantastically delivered in this film, I think. And do, I mean, do you think it stands the test of time, Theatre of Blood? Oh, <laughs> let's not worry about that question. There goes the timer. <laughs> Moving swiftly along, oh. but but staying in the same year, 1973 is The Wicker Man. The Wicker Man. The, the single most important film of your life and career, you, you say to me in your teaser. By the end of... By the end of this speech, I'm going to make Dave about the Wicker Man. Um, I'm going to convince you that magic actually exists, right? Okay, I'm all for that. I'm here. Right. 
I first saw The Wicker Man when I was 14 on the 25th of January, 1985. And I was watching it on LWT. It wasn't the 102 minute version. This was the theatrical cut for, for, for Nerd. Mm-hmm. And unbelievably, on the other side, on Channel 4 that night, they were showing a razor head. <laughs> so two Scarlet favourites immediately. And during the ad breaks, I would flick back out while watching a razor head. I'd flick back over to Wicked Man. I'd never seen either of them before. And my mind was completely blown. And after a bit, I ended up settling with the Wicker Man. I ended up sticking with the Wicker Man because it had a more sort of coherent storyline uh, and also Britt Eklund, let's face it. Um, mm-hmm. So there you go. So I first saw it when I was 14. And um, I originally got into film writing. This is how I originally got into film writing. After I wrote an article for The Guardian about the Wicker Man for The Guardian in 1998. And that article led directly to a publishing deal I was called up by Fourth Estate literally that that the day the paper came out, which never oh, happens, man. kids, by the way, um, who called up and said, would you like to write a whole book about the Wicker Man? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. Um, and a week later, he called back. His name was Andy Miller. You, you may know him as the, he's gone on to become the, the host of a, of a quite celebrated it's got a literary podcast. Um, but back then he was a commissioning editor. And a week later, he phoned back and said, oh, I'm really sorry. Someone else is writing a book about the Wicker Man. Uh, so we had another week, myself and my co-writer, si- the late Simon Wells, uh, crying into our sandwiches, going, oh, God, we could have we could have done it. You know, I was 29, you know, I was in 30. Um, and then he called back and said, would you like to write an entire book about British cult movies? And for the, benefit, for the benefit of your listeners, here it is. It's called Your Face Here, British Cult Movies Since the 60s. And it's the first book ever written about British cult movies exclusively. Um, and it was quite, it was quite sort of critically acclaimed at the time, if I say so myself. Um, anyway, and because of that book, uh, during that book, I, that, that, that book had a chapter on Clockwork Orange in it. And because I knew that Jane's experience with the Clockwork Orange, um, and the Scarlet, I called her up and I said, Jane, I didn't know from Adam at that point. I said, Jane, this is back in 2000. Would you like to talk about the Clockwork Cronus trial? And she said, no, fuck off. Uh, Quite reasonably, because it was still quite raw. You know, it was only like sort of, you know, seven years or something after after the court case. So I said, oh, absolutely. All right, then. Um, So because of this book, uh, anyway, because of this book, I became a freelance film writer for the next 20 years. Um, And, you know, I got to know Jane again. Uh, through through things like that, and Jane then became uh, then then Jane invited me to co-direct Scala with her. Um, now I'll tell you this: the last build film that the Scala showed before its closure in 1993, in a double bill with uh, Witchfinder General, was The Wicker Man. And to honour this, we've made it a clip um, over the credits reel of the final film in our in our credits. And I want to tell you that on the summer solstice of this year, generally associated with May Day and with the film The Wicker Man, the BFI announced it had picked up UK and Ireland rights for our debut movie. Magic is real. I rest my case. You you thought it and, and you manifested it and uh, was it was the, 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 the you manifest it and then it happens. Is that what you're saying? And that and, and that is why the Wicker Man is the most important film of my of of, of, of my of my life and career. Full stop. It's it's an extraordinary piece of work. I'm, I'm, I I don't know what there is left to say about it, but it is. Yeah, it's incredible. And now we're in the the 50th anniversary of it, and I'm so delighted that more and more people will. We'll, we'll, we'll come to uh, we'll, we'll come to find my fa- my favorite little fact about the Wicker Man is how um, it was received in the Southern States of America not as a horror film but as a film about martyrdom in the sense of Edward Woodward doesn't lose his faith and that was seen as the power of God and you're like that is one brilliant reading of that film. <laughs> That's absolutely right. The producer, Peter Snell, and director Robin Hardy, actually, as you say, took it round those some yeah. states and, and said, do, do, said, do you find this offensive? And they said, no, because it, it's it's absolutely uh, logical and correct within that, within that framework. Mm. You know? yeah. Absolutely phenomenal, yeah. Well, look, sir, that's bang on, bang on five minutes. Fantastic. I will put, as I said in the interview part of the podcast i will put links in the show notes about dates and stuff and i'll when i tweet about it i'll, I'll say all that it just gives me to say thank you very much for joining us on the britflix podcast thank you that's, that's such great questions thanks so much